Good morning. Welcome. I'm Deborah Gorman Smith. I am honored to be Dean of the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 hooding ceremony. Let me say immediately, uh, and we will say this often today, congratulations for all that you have accomplished. I am so thrilled that we are meeting in person. It still is lovely to be able to say in person um, in Rockefeller Memorial Chapel. This magnificent place captures the grandness of this day and all that you have accomplished. And I'm so gratified to see all of you here today. We want to celebrate your extraordinary efforts and achievements, the hours of studying, the papers, the classes, and the field work are done. You've reached the finish line of your studies here. Many of you has also, have also had to balance coursework while competing family with competing family responsibilities. You have shown great resilience, heart, and commitment, all core attributes of the profession you have chosen. I want to thank my faculty colleagues for mentoring, challenging, and inspiring our students and for all the innovative ways that they advance the school's mission and values through research, teaching, and action. Thanks also to our committed and talented staff who throughout the year make sure that the school runs smoothly under very demanding circumstances and while juggling many deadlines. And finally, I want to congratulate the parents, families, and many friends of the graduates who are here today your support has been invaluable, and it's certainly a major reason why these graduates are so successful. You deserve our deepest thanks and a round of applause. We are confronting a world that is challenging us to rethink our way of life and learning, our vision of justice and community, and our capacity to change. Reimagining the world is part of this school's history and tradition. From the start, the school's founders had a unique vision. This school would not just provide practical training for caseworkers or provide charity or relief services, Instead, unlike other schools of social work at the time, our leaders were committed to conducting first-rate research and believed this research should be the basis of an education in social work and social welfare. They also insisted that the work should connect to and reflect major social issues of the time. They wanted a training program that was rigorous, and they wanted their students to have an impact on society. This vision was bold and unheard of. It was a grand and controversial experiment, and it happened during years of great challenge, tumult, and pain. It was led by women, women who had not yet won the right to vote. The 1918 flu pandemic had infected one-third of the world. The nation was at war, and soldiers were still fighting and dying. In the midst of these dire circumstances, the Crown Family School got its start and launched the Chicago tradition of social work education. Our ability to adapt will be constantly tested. In the best of times, our world presents extreme social challenges that require nuanced and imaginative thinking. This is what you have been training for. You are the policymakers, frontline workers, teachers, and advocates who will innovate and drive social change, inclusion, and action. We need to continue this school's great traditions that we'll, we will be responsive, serious, and continue to make real impact in the lives of individuals, families, and communities. I am reminded every day how hard this work is. This school has always been about reducing disparities, giving voice to the forgotten, and uplifting the most vulnerable and marginalized. This is your moment. Your training and your work could not be more relevant and important, and I know you are ready to take on this challenge. 
Seeing you today makes me feel extremely optimistic and uplifted. I want all of you to enjoy this day. I wish you health, happiness, and great success. Thank you, good luck, and again, congratulations. Now, I'd like to invite Chris Akel, class of 2023, and recipient of the 2022 Wilma Walker Award to share congratulatory remarks and introduce our keynote speaker for today. First, a few words about Chris. Chris, and here's Chris. Chris is a member of the Contextual Behavioral Practices Program of Study and a University of Chicago Obama Foundation Scholar. <laughs> he came to the Crown Family School after teaching in middle and high schools in the United States and also serving as a college counselor in Palestine. Chris is the co-founder of Pathways, an organization that serves to enhance college access and youth development for rural, refugee, and low-income students living in Palestine. As he turns his attention to clinical mental health roles in the Chicago area, he hopes to hone his work in counseling and therapeutic settings in service to greater laboratory mental health offerings, especially in underserved communities at home and abroad. He's leaving his time at the Crown Family School with a full heart and a greater sense of clarity about his future work. Chris, make yours. Thank you, Dean Gorman-Smith. Um, hello, hello, and a thousand congratulations. Alf, alf, mavruk. I'm Christopher Akel, or Akel, if I'm going through an airport. And I came to graduate school last year. I'm a social work AM student, now alum. And I'm a former middle school teacher. You just heard the bio. Today I'm graduating with you. And maybe more importantly, I'm graduating from cohort eight. It was great. Like many of you, I'm astounded by how much has happened in these past years for me and how little I can see the future and predict. I remember submitting my application back in 2021 as the world fell apart. I submitted minutes before the deadline without much relief, and then that relief came a few months later after I read the acceptance letter. And then my anxiety returned after I'd committed to the next two years, only a few weeks later. I've only done things for, we were talking about this, four years at a time. I remember the first eight jitters kind of felt like this. I remember the big crash at finals last year. I remember the wash of last summer, the repose I felt, the crisp autumn morning of my first day this year. Along the way, I met some wonderful people looking left and right. Really, really happy to see folks in the audience and really happy to see the inside of this chapel. Never been in here. A week ago, I finished my final class, made up of mostly first years, itching to find and start their second year placements. They were all asking, what if I don't have one? Is my life over? Did I make the right decision? And I realized how much I changed. I felt grounded. It's been a time. And now we're here. In the poem, Spoiler, by a Palestinian poet and clinical psychologist, Hala Alian, she states, I'm here to tell you the tide will never stop coming in. I'm here to tell you, whatever you build will be ruined, so make it beautiful. This day is a day of continuation, and the tide won't stop. The world is falling apart, things are ruining. But today's continuation is also an important day for us to look at the beauty that we've made so far. We've grown from our wisdom texts, from our sacred communities, and from old and new relationships, and we've grown tremendously from our teachers and our guides inside and outside of this program. In a few minutes, we're gonna hear from one of them, a person who, in the words of one of her nominators, served as a careful steward of the space she holds in class. This program houses indisputable amounts of expertise. Our faculty continue to redefine what research means every single day. But as a former middle school teacher myself, what made the difference in my experience was not the professor's unquestionable resume and knowledge, but instead the vigor of their fac uh, facilitation and the rigor of their pedagogy, a word that I've used, if you've known me, in sickening quantities over the last two years. In celebration of this, today we honor an incredible faculty member who exemplifies this educational vitality 
with this year's recipient of the 2023 William Pollock Excellence in Teaching Award. The award began nearly three decades ago, renamed for a celebrated long-term faculty of economic analysis, former associate and deputy dean, and now professor emeritus, Dr. William Pollock, and has celebrated many of this institution's finest educators. Some of them are actually in this room today. It biannually recognizes outstanding teaching of any full-time faculty or lecturers of master's level classes. Now look, y'all, that's all wonderful and dandy to say about one person, but we know from our experience that there are numerous people in our lives, numerous faculty that have lived up to these values. My own parents and my sister and my sister's partner is here today too. So before we move into celebrating this one person, let's take a moment and I invite you to take a breath, conjure the image of the person who helped you through your time here. Bring that person into your mind's eye. And I invite you to imagine taking a hug or a handshake with that person, a smile or a nod, whatever seems meaningful to you. Imagine filling that person's cup up with the same gratefulness or warmth that you might feel as you thought about them. That feeling, the one you might have just felt, that is the way students have felt about this professor we are, we're here to honor today. For this year's recipient of the award, 22 of her former students wrote nominations, and at least one of them has taken three full classes with her. That is a full quarter of their experience in the two-year program. It's a lot. To put this in context, I just returned from a wedding, the large group of friends landed in Chicago, turned off the airplane mode, and five to 10 texts came through, mostly from my family, asking me if I had arrived safely, how I felt, it's good to see me. It took all of 10 seconds to write those for each person. In contrast, this professor received multiple three to nine paragraph essays from 22 students for a nomination that they weren't sure was gonna happen. That is impressive. A little background, this professor has been a full-time educator at the School of Social Work since 2015, and today researches refugee policy and resettlements, leads many of our school's org theory and policy classes as an instructional associate professor, and received a course development grant recently from the Posen Family Center for Human Rights. She is a longtime attendee of the university's bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs, has served as the executive director of an education-based nonprofit in East and Southern Africa, and all of this alongside over having two decades of service with the Weibolt Foundation that supports Chicago-based grassroots organizing. Furthermore, she's advised, if that wasn't enough, she's advised 415 teaching assistants impacted hundreds of students and has left a lasting impression on me as well. Some of the things her former students say to describe her is that she's a powerful educator who provides insight into the narrative she skillfully weaves together. They say she has a way of provoking complex conversation in a way that doesn't often happen since many of us agree on some social issues. Another student wrote that she values our opinion and believes that entrenching, enriching student learning experience has to be an ongoing process. And yet another stated she's exceptional in meeting students where they are beyond the classroom, extending deadlines, advocating for paid internships, changing the route of her lecture if the class is falling flat, which I never experienced, but I'm sure has happened. <laughs> My own experience with this professor has been similarly inspiring. The first time I met her, I was aching for more support. I had come to school with a little bit of experience, but a dearth of theoretical expertise, and I quickly realized that my own learning required, you guessed it, strong pedagogy. From day one, this teacher used every single moment as an educational opportunity. She utilized her classroom as a parallel processing space, facilitating debates and conversations about policy, while also pulling the curtain back on exactly what she was doing so that we knew what she was doing and why. It was impressive to watch. She cares deeply about her students' learning, from scaffolded annotations to daily discussion post responses that I could not keep up with. Don't tell her that. And she listens to them, particularly when they disagree, even with her. One moment that particularly stands out was toward the end of my time in her class. Along with another classmate who might remember this moment, we went to the library and we recorded a voice response to one of our readings, which I found rather archaic. I wish I had thought of that word. 
With the weight of many sleepless weeks and finals and pressure, I simply didn't have the capacity to filter my thoughts and found myself explicitly railing on the conscience of the reading and the choice of this text from the teacher and why, probably dropping some F-bombs. I felt ashamed afterwards and somewhat reticent to share the recording, but we did. It's out there somewhere. And this professor's response was both welcoming of critique and warm in her embrace of the process. I found myself more enamored with her teaching after this experience than before. And that respect has only grown since. She's supported me inside and outside the classroom many, many times. And I know she's done the same for so many of you. Hala Alian, the Palestinian poet I previously quoted, posed the two ideas of ruin and beauty side by side in pure Palestinian dialectical fashion. This both and approach must remain front and center in an educational institution if it is to move into the uncertain future. And this professor fully embodies that firm embrace of opposites together. I could go on, but I want us to hear from this incredible person, someone who has walked side by side with the greatest educators past and present in our school. So let's bring our respect for this incredible pool of educators and specifically for this year's recipient of the William Pollock Excellence in Teaching Award, Dr. Jessica H. Darrow. Can I just take a second and say it's real hot in here? <laughs> take a drink. It's just like name the thing, you know? Fitting words to start. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so I had my first panic attack in a classroom. Fourth grade, French class. I was supposed to be conjugating verbs. Instead, I was deafened by the sound of pencils scratching on paper as kids around me were rapidly working on that quiz. My face burned, my eyes stung, and I was terrified that someone would notice. And then I couldn't breathe. In 10th grade, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. I'd already moved between three different schools and deeply internalized this message that my struggles in school could be attributed to my lack of investment, my refusal to do hard work, my being too social. In college, I applied for a language exemption based on this diagnosed learning disability, and the school upheld its policy. I was invited to complete the language requirement. However, they assured me that if I took the class, demonstrated effort, and still got a failing grade, I would be excused from the remainder of the required language classes. Uh-huh, that happened. Yep. I dropped down to part-time after this. It was becoming pretty clear that I did not have what it takes to succeed in a university. You see, I came up in a series of predominantly white institutions. The structure and values of these institutions were all I knew for most of my young life. As a white person, it seemed to me that I should be able to thrive in these schools. For those who are unfamiliar, a predominantly white institution, or PWI, is an institution where more than 50% of the student body is white. But that definition does not capture the essence of these places. Most PWIs were founded by wealthy white people. They operate in ways that perpetuate and affirm their own structures and values of white supremacy. We read curricula written by white people. We engage in classroom structures designed by white people for neurotypical and able-bodied learners. And we operate within classroom cultures that evolved out of white middle-class norms. If your people came up in PWIs, as mine did, then you probably know what's expected of you. 
racial identity is one of the dominant determinants of structural inequality in these schools. Other determinants include class, gender, sexuality, ability, what I'm saying is that PWIs aren't built to be feel inclusive for everyone. And yet, if you're in one, if it's a struggle to be there or to survive there, if it feels impossible to thrive, it can feel like it's your fault. So when I failed, it felt like there was something wrong with me. And in the eyes of the PWI, there is. I'm neurodivergent which means I do not learn in the way these schools are designed to teach. I've healed from these early experiences in education, and that healing came after years of anger and shame and some very fun rebellion that I will not detail here. <laughs> then came the hard work of honest self-reflection and efforts to figure out what I really wanted my contribution to this world to be. And I realized that curiosity and interest was leading me back to school. Who would have guessed? Definitely not my fourth grade French teacher. I came back to school to this very institution and learned what it means to be a social worker, an advocate for social and racial justice, and a scholar. All that said, it took me a long time to enjoy being in a classroom. And leading up to today, I've been reflecting on what shifted those feelings for me so that now I feel joy when I walk into E3. I've learned a lot from my family. My oldest child, taking an exam right now, Stella, she's 14. To the caregivers out there, I know you feel me here. 14. Stella taught me to listen. When she was little, she talked a lot. But as the teenage years got closer, she became more reticent to share. And so I found I had to work harder to hear her while not leaning in so far as to smother her. Cassius, or Cashew Nut, my 10-year-old, has taught me to see people past what I think of them and want for them and into who they are. Cassius wants me to share that this is because they're trans. And while, of course, that is part of the story, it's also because they're their own person. And I have figured out that my only job is to learn who that is and give them what they need to shine. And my husband, Mike, he's taught me to feel things and stay present, to grieve, to love, to rest, and yes, to work. When Bell Hooks says, bring your whole self to the classroom, I think this is what she means. Bring it all. Use it and share it. Learning from my family has made me a better human and thus a better teacher. And as I continue to learn and develop in my teaching practice, I engage in the reflective work of noting where and how my whiteness shows up and then drawing on praxis that is not white-centric. I'm learning from the wisdom and hard work of indigenous and black activists and educators and drawing on a disability justice approach in learning design. And always, I'm learning from you. So graduates, most of you came into this school with a bold vision of a radical and transformative kind of social work in which you upend the structures that create and maintain oppression and injustice. You've railed against capitalism as a catalyst for inequity. At times, you voiced your frustration and even despair when you found that the structure of this PWI did not align with your hopes for liberating profession, like social work. So one challenge that I've held with you is that white supremacy culture stands in tension with the stated values and ethics of social work. And if our goal is to repair some of the harms of our profession's engagement in social control, we need to divest from the values of the PWI. Let me be specific. Tema Oaken explains that while white supremacy culture values perfection, there are ways to uplift excellence without holding a standard of perfection. Because perfection as a goal creates the incentive to avoid innovation and risk taking. So in her words, white supremacy culture operates to limit our thinking and often to make it fear-based. And when people are in a fear-based place, we can't think very creatively or open-heartedly. 
Well, if these are some of the hallmarks and characteristics that predominantly white institutions were founded on and now perpetuate, then what does a school of social work look like in such a university? I think that one of you explained this beautifully in an email you wrote to me in which you said, quote, at our school, we encounter vastly different people and sometimes I find it challenging to share my thoughts and passions. However, when social workers come together and create an organization or environment to exchange ideas freely, we can build a stronger collective power than in any other field. We're all gathered here with the hope for change. Thank you, Juhei. Part of what resonates for me in this quote is the notion that social workers have a responsibility to build structures and systems that open space within them for joy, for creativity, and diversity of thought and experience. It's within this type of clinical milieu or organizational setting that social work can be transformative. This is the work I'm committed to. The kind of spaces I have tried to develop in our classrooms are ones where I am committed to hearing you, to helping you access what you need to shine, and to be present with you in my full self and encouraging you to be yours. I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to teach in this school where we are actually invited to envision and enact the classroom in new ways. Within this predominantly white institution, we can take the word predominantly at its meaning. It implies not exclusively. So here we have the opportunity to create new kinds of communities, ones where all people are beautiful and brilliant in their own ways. I'm humbled by the nominations I received for this award, and I'm honored to have co-created spaces that we were proud to be in together. So to cohort eight, who imagined a world without police, to the refugee policy class who embraced narratives, to the organizational theorists who really dig community organizing and advocacy, and to the climate change activists who face the urgency of environmental justice work with boldness, Thank you. I also want to take a moment and ask you all to join me in thanking the teams who make our teaching and learning work possible. The IT, facilities, field, and DOS teams, thank you. And to Carrie who even now is at the front desk and will greet us and our loved ones when we return to the building to celebrate. Thank you, Carrie. I thank my colleagues on the stage who lean into this work. Yes, I can do better. We can do better. And as you graduates all move on to the next stage of your careers, those of us who stay will be continuing to dream, enact, and work to be better. So I'd like to close by sharing one example of what that dream can look like. Recently, one of my class communities went on a field trip where we walked in the prairie and woods. Stella thought that was a very cheesy expression. We've been learning about climate change and its effects on migration and the relationship between environmental injustice and immobility. At many times, we've been overwhelmed by a very global, bleak future and the refusal of people in power and their corporations to give up their worship of financial profit in favor of environmental and racial justice. So we have been mourning. But on this day, we walked in the woods and sat in the grass, and we just let ourselves be. One of you shared I see so many flowers that I don't know the names of, and I don't need to know, because it's about what I feel. Another of you reflected, learning doesn't have to be stressful. The classroom can be expansive, existing within nature and with a community. So this can be teaching and learning, and doesn't it sound like joy? Here's what I've loved and cherished about my time with this graduating class. You are anger and joy, righteous and humble. 
You are disability justice, treatment not trauma. You are work and you are rest. You are curiosity, you are brilliance. You are payments for placements. You are love and you are beautiful. To the class of 2023, I am so proud to welcome you into the profession of social work, to partner with you as you dream and insist on liberation and justice. So now it is my, I keep doing this, I keep breaking this, a uh, great honor to officially present Dr. Jessica Darrow with the 2023 William Pollock Teaching Award. All right, thank you, Dean Gorman-Smith. Thank you, Dr. Jessica Darrow. It's great to be here with y'all this morning. How y'all doing? All right, delighted to be here to celebrate our amazing graduates. I'm also thrilled to represent our DOS team who have the pleasure and honor of engaging with you all from the admissions process all the way to this very moment. And we couldn't be more proud of y'all. Just a couple weeks ago, we gathered in Edith Abbott Hall to have our annual student recognition ceremony. We distributed awards for excellence in field education, commitment to the field of service to older adults, exemplary community and leadership service, and overall outstanding scholarship and professional leadership. Additionally, we celebrated over 70 students who have completed further requirements in our programs of study. Some of our graduates today have also received competitive university and national awards such as the Pose and Human Rights Fellowship and the Social New Venture Challenge, UChicago's nationally ranked business launch program that aims to solve complex social and environmental issues. A listing of our awardees is located within your programs and on our website. However, will all the students who have received selective awards or were nominated or honored at the student recognition ceremony please rise to be celebrated? Congratulations. And a final word to our graduates, as you wrap up this journey and prepare for the next chapter in your lives and careers, I hope this ceremony helps you feel one step closer to your purpose and to your calling. I hope you'll always consider how your strengths, um, your strengths can help address the world's greatest needs. And finally, I hope you'll stay connected to your Crown Family School community. As you look around at each other and up on this chancel and think about those that made an impact on you but perhaps aren't here, as Chris said, remember that these are the folks who first welcomed you into this community and helped you feel a sense of belonging, who saw your potential to make an impact in the world, who asked you tough but necessary questions, who lifted you up or just held space for you during tough times. Because of all of this, all of the things we've experienced together, we're forever connected. So always remember those moments, both small and big, and never forget your entire Crown Family School community is here with you and will be with you wherever life takes you. Thank you and congratulations. At this time, I ask that our Crown Family School staff, students and faculty get into place to formally hood our graduates.
We will first recognize graduates from our Master of Arts in Social Sector Leadership and Nonprofit Management. Sabrina Denise Bellamy. <laughs> Katie Lynn Dudek. Ryan Garcia. <laughs> Jocelyn Amanda Hernandez. Natalie Killian Jones. <laughs> Julian Marie Leal. Oscar Montanez. <laughs> Dion Malcolm Owens. Michelle Pagano. <laughs> Elise Marie Polly. <laughs> Joanne Sub. Devin Antonio Van Houten Maldonado. <laughs> Allah Ahmed Abdel Dayam. <laughs> Tasha Ann Abraham. Kristen Lena Adams. Claire Elizabeth Adams. Alina Ahmed. <laughs> Chris.
Christopher Akel. Laurel Hope Baker. C.J. Beck. Nia K. Benton Roberson. <laughs> Sophia Berger de Souza. Arunima Bhattacharji. <laughs> Madeline Bick. <laughs> Caroline Bradford Blanton. Madeline Boshi. <laughs> Laura Kate Ball. Jane Margaret Bolton. <laughs> Valerie Jaharis. Clark Abraham Bray. <laughs> Sunshari Brewer. <laughs> Kai Jolene Brink. Shamaya Bird. <laughs> Rain Casares. <laughs> Tony Annette Calhoun. Phoebe Celine Kaplan. <laughs> June Carter. <laughs> Hatcher Rhodes Chapman. Jesse Chasen Tabor. Grant Schutz. Alexa Rose Sinkyu.
Hannah Burrow Clegg. Rebecca Carol Cavode Berry. Kiera Mache Craig. Charlotte Rayo Kramer. Jocelyn Rain Dangler. Olivia Deprilli. Isabella Domino. Elizabeth Depentu. Jesus Hernandez. Nina Win Din. Faith McKenna Doney. Wenjia Doe. Layla Drury. Kate Doolin. <laughs> Kira Nicole Edwards. <laughs> Sophia Elizabeth Eisenberg. Julia Adair English. Grace Farley. Faeza Firuza Fatiza De. Brenda Crass Feinberg. Grace Ann Finley. Emily Catherine Facer. Alexandra Lisette Galvan. <laughs> Louise Siu Gao. <laughs> Alexandra Gates. Simon Genstrbloom. Christine Virginia Goggins. Miranda Paris Gore Diaz.
Alexa Diane Goins. Noel C. Green. Margot Greer. Shereen Nicole Gross. James Joseph Guarnaccia. Eduardo Gutierrez. Autumn Marie Hagstrom. Rose Hankis. <laughs> Hannah Marie Poener. <laughs> Constance Allen Hall. Eros Imhoff. <laughs> Rachel Iverson. <laughs> Isha Jambala. <laughs> Laura Catherine Johnson. Maya Jones. <laughs> Rania Kamel. <laughs> Ashlyn Kamoy. Naomi Kaplan. <laughs> Catalina McCann Rivera. Samina Zulfikar Kassam. <laughs> Almira Khan. <laughs> Layla Khani. Bethel Kifle. Eugene Kim. Celia Lindsay Kokoris. Zatio Nancy Kone. <laughs> Yinan Kwong. <laughs> J. 
Jessica Sarah Levinson. Nicole Lavagnac. Elizabeth Ashton Lewandowski. Jindian Lee. Sin Shua Lee. Frederica Oppenheim Lipman. Shin Ran Leo. Asia K. Locke. Alejandra Lopez. <laughs> Sabina Lumisberger. <laughs> Carrie Ann Lydon. Hamza Imam Malik. <laughs> Aislin Reiko Malile. <laughs> Sinyin Mao. Fernanda Marcus Estevez. Amy Rebecca Martin. Jacob Paul Mason Marshall. Annalise Page Matsuo. Samantha Elizabeth McCarthy. Reese Stella McCormick. Catherine Emma McKinney. Charlize Jackie Mender. Aaron Danielle Motoro. Eliza Christine Mollensack. <laughs> Sophia Mora Fitzgerald. <laughs> Gwyneth Elise Morris.
Olivia Bell Morris. Karam Muxed. Justin Yunjun Moon. Bianca Guadalupe Murillo Franco. Lina Ray Neidhart. Alyssa Rose Orono. Angela Y. O. RuPaul Polywall. Samuel Peterson. <laughs> Hillary Nicole Aringo Peregrina. <laughs> Megan Elizabeth Peterson. Caitlin Nicole Ramian. Erica Malaya Ramos. Priscilla Ramos Rico. Alexandra Marie Reifenberg. Margot Parsons Rice. Julia Reardon. Tiffany Paola Rivera Di Lucio. <laughs> Megan Rowe. Nina Angelica Rodriguez. <laughs> Maya Felice Ross Trubin. <laughs> Olivia Rowley. Charlie Ruiz. <laughs> Amalia Victoria Salmoran. <laughs> Gabriel Asher Lucan Schendler. Brooke Karen Schwartz. <laughs> Brooke 
Danielle Schwartz. Hannah Mackenzie Scott. Daniel Chance Cedar. Sarah Christina Sharp. Amal Sheikh Hadem. Shin Shu. Rebecca Adelaide Silverman. Marissa Smith. Christina Lee Squires. Charlotte Strazis. Gregory R. Sutherland. Jacob Sweeto. Hannah Lee Sinnott. Michaela Rose Therado. Sarah Tomas Morgan. Saranya Tongmar. Maya Diaz Trinka. Isabella Rosa Unger. Mireya Valdivia. Melina Vani Gonzalez. K. Vecchia Zeitz. Myra Villas. Marna Simon Wall. <laughs> Jessica Wong. <laughs> Sasha Soper Weiner. Kelsey Weisberg.
Julia Cantor Wellich. Carol Elizabeth Wilbur. Benjamin James Butler Wills. Nia Iman Wilson. Kayla Winger. Joshua Wong. Lei Wu. Julia Yaccarino. Sandra Yamin. Shamira Yusuf. Sean Weinstein. All right, and now we'll congratulate our master's degree candidates from the class, class of 2023. <laughs> All right. And now we will recognize and hood graduates from our doctoral program in social work and social welfare. Serene Bahia Urshade. <laughs> Dissertation title, Understanding the impact of educational and non-educational structures of opportunity and disinvestment on students' overage for grade. I'd like now now I'd like to welcome back Dean Gorman Smith. Serene. Okay. Um, so excited about Serene. Um, Allison, right? yes, Allison Laurie Paulson. <laughs> the dissertation Healthcare Utilization and 12 Month Mortality Following a Non Fatal Opioid Overdose Among Non Elderly Individuals. Duly enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid 2014 to 2016. <laughs> Tadeo Miguel Gerardo Weiner Davis. His dissertation title, Obama Yes, Displacement No, an ethnographic study of the Obama Presidential Center Community Benefits Agreement Coalition. Yeah. 
Jade Chelsea Wong. Dissertation. <laughs> Dissertation title, Ambivalent Adventures with Standards. <laughs> Congratulations to all our PhD graduates. And now, uh, before we close the ceremony, I'd like to ask all the graduates, masters and PhD, to please stand, turn, face your guests, so they can congratulate and applaud you. And in return, let us graduates and, special, and social work colleagues take a moment to express our appreciation and gratitude for family and friends, for the love and support they have provided to help you reach this moment. So thank your families. Regardless of our different backgrounds and experiences, we all came to this profession with common values and ambitions. We came here wanting to engage and learn in a culture that uses knowledge and critical thinking to examine issues, find answers, and importantly, take action to improve lives and communities. Enjoy the day. We have a party back at the school. And together, we will work to create and advance a better and more equitable world. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs>